You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here's your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. I am Coach Jen in Ocala, Florida, and you are listening to Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for May 2nd, episode 3423. Mary Kitts Miller is out and about gathering intel for upcoming episodes, so sit back and enjoy this previously aired masterpiece from way back in 2017 when the show was live and unedited, so you get to hear all the bumps and bobbles along the way. Good Thursday morning, everybody. I am Glenn the Geek from Ocala, Florida. And I'm Mary Kitzmiller from Kemp, Texas. And you are listening to Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for June 8th, episode 1713. Today's show is brought to you by Horseware. Good morning, Horse World. What is your favorite day of the week? You never stop learning. You never stop understanding. It's more in depth than just riding a horse knowing that for the rest of my life I could work on this and, and I'll never stop learning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's Mary Kitzmiller Day, Horse Training Day 101, and we're glad to have Mary back. Mary's here the second Thursday of every month, and... Uh, we're actually here live today, so good morning, Mary. Good morning. How are you? Good. You've been out traveling the world over the uh, last uh, month or so. We're going to chat a little bit about that. Uh, also, you've been thoroughly entertaining the auditors with some things going on, but let's find out what's Jennifer. what Jennifer has to say about today's show. We've got listener questions with matching trainer answers galore. And James Shaw is going to stop by. He's a Tai Chi instructor, and he helps riders use Tai Chi to ride better. So stay tuned for the fray, folks. Yeah, we got a theme in today's show. It's pretty much chilling out. Chilling. Yes, which, which is what I need. I, I need it in my life right now. <laughs> so let's start with humor today. You've been posting about your adventures with your neighbor. Now, Mary kind of lives in very rural Texas and uh, has some interesting neighbors, and uh, uh, she's not been really happy with them this past couple of weeks. Yeah, I, I have to say, I have to specify which crazy neighbor it is, because I have a few. There's Crazy Steve, who shoots at the birds in his trees that I'm not sure are really there. Um, <laughs> Does he have, do you ever see him falling? Um, no, no, well, that's no, okay. well, then it's crazy, it might not be there. <laughs> crazy Steve. And, and I'm not sure where Steve lives because he has a travel trailer that looks ancient and not plugged into anything. And then his actual house, he's building out of semi truck trailers and it's two stories high and it's like not finished. Like I can see into the house from the street. So I'm not sure what Steve's got for indoor plumbing, but uh, but Steve hasn't been he's been quiet lately, so that's good. And, you we know, it's, saw it's not a the... lot of those houses on St. Martin. The, really? The, uh, the well, they ship, were the con ship containers. Ship containers. Yeah, they were like. Yeah, ship yeah, yeah. This is kind of what that is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They made houses out of them, and the and and I think it was after they had a big hurricane, and that's what they used for houses after the big hurricane. But my God, it's hot down there, and there were no air conditioners on these things. They must be like three hundred degrees inside. Oh yeah, and and I've seen it where people do them up really cute, you know, the whole tiny house movement, and it's really hip and modern. And That's not I saw like <laughs> no, it steezes a box with some lumber in it, and um, so so there's Steve, and then you know, of course, I've talked before about the neighbor who had to get taken out by the Texas Rangers. That's a whole other story. Um, but no, these are newer neighbors who've moved in next door and um, it's it's got a little bit of acreage, but the fencing um, is really run down. There's a lot of holes in the barbed wire fencing and they keep getting animals and I don't know why. I don't know what their goal is. They're not farming. They're not 
I don't think they're going to like be eating the animals or I don't think they're pets because I never see them home. And so of all the animals that they have gotten that have immediately escaped onto my property, we've had um, several different sheep um, and a jack donkey. That lasted on their place for all of about two minutes. They got a intact jack donkey. So he's like a stud. And of course, we have a mighty herd of donkeys on our side. <laughs> and, you know, you can't have a donkey and leave it alone. You just have it alone. And so this poor little guy, he was actually really sweet, but he busted, popped through the fence, jumped into our pasture um, because they will find a way to find what they're looking for. And uh, I like had a that. great, <laughs> yes. I, well, and, and I have a donkey, a rescue donkey who is not a Jack, but he still thinks he is. So he valiantly defended his Her. harem from, <laughs> yeah, from, and so we had a, a epic, like wild donkey fight out on the range of my property. And so we had to corral this thing up and keep him for a week. And we pr- basically told him, do not take him back unless you have Fencing. This is the theme. Did you please fix your fence before you buy another animal? So they had one of their friends come and bring a trailer and herd it up and take it. I don't know where, but it's gone. And then uh, uh, the other night we get a text. Uh, I guess they send it about 730, but you know, we're in the booties. So we don't have good cell service. So we get it at 1030. They're like, um, we just bought a beef master bull. Uh, he's less than a year old. Uh, but he crossed over into your property. We'll come get him tomorrow. Like, what? So I don't know if he's broken fencing. I don't know what he's doing. I have a very sweet little baby dairy cow on my side of the property, you know, on, on my property. So I don't know if he's terrorizing her. And so we're out there with flashlights driving all over the place. They're asleep, you know, because they're going to do it tomorrow. So... <laughs> So didn't find a bull anywhere. I didn't find any breaks in our fencing. But um, I go on a bike ride the next morning. And I, I'm about a mile away from the house. And I pass this gigantic bull um, just on the road. And that was their bull. And I had to convince them it was their bull. I sent them a picture. I'm like, is this your bull? They're like, no, it's not our bull. And so I sent them a picture of this red bull with white stockings. And he's got spots everywhere. They're like... So I sent them that picture and they're going like, that's not our bull. Our bull is a red bull with white stockings. And I'm looking at the picture, looking at the description. I'm like, pretty sure it's the same bull. And then I said, are you sure? Because she said a lot of people, she goes, we've called the sheriff because they don't have a trailer either, nor do they know anything about animals. So that even if they found him, they, I don't know how they're going to get him back. And so, um, I said, are you sure it's not your bull? Because she said people have reported it over by the cemetery in our neighborhood. And I said, yeah, that's where I found this bull. And so she, then she sent me a picture. She's like, no, 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 this is our bull. Same bull. I look at it. So I, I zoom in on the picture that I took. Like, so she could clearly see the markings, send it back. I'm like, this is your bull. And, uh, so it was a couple of days before a friend of theirs with a trailer showed up and they rounded up the bull. I don't know where it came from. I don't know if someone had put it on their property holding it or if the county had. I have no idea. But what their solution to the problem is, is they I thought maybe like the donkey that their friend would cart it off. They'd realize that we shouldn't own animals. No, that's not what happened. Um They brought the bull back and decided the best place to keep it is a dog kennel, a chain link dog kennel. That's like a six by eight space for this really, really large bull. So, um, yeah, I'm probably going to be making some phone calls in the future. It's not something that people usually buy. They're not really good for meat when they get that large and older. They're they're just, (laughs) I don't know why they bought a bull. Do you think they're fighters and they're practicing? No, I think they just traded it. They really, 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 uh, they, they, they're they trading. That's what they're doing. They're yeah, trading. Maybe that's what yeah. Do. I don't know if it's friends of theirs who are like, I need a spot to keep my bull. And they're like, I got you, buddy. And yet have no Could fencing. Yeah. And, oh, my God. Well, they the only other, so if they're getting it for, quote, unquote, breeding, the only other cow they have is this little tiny baby dairy calf that just lives in their front yard. And that thing doesn't escape 
for whatever reason, I don't know. Um, their method before to try to keep sheep from coming over to our property. Oh, they have sheep um, too? <laughs> yes. Oh, I didn't even go into the sheep. That was <laughs> So they got this ram and this ewe. And the reason they got the ram was he was so aggressive, he killed another sheep. I'm like, you probably shouldn't have that animal at all. And uh, so this ram and this ewe, and immediately they come over to our place. And then um, then they get this other ewe, and she's pregnant. And all they have is this roofless chain link dog kennel that's in a low-lying area of their property. And it was cold at this time. So we kind of felt bad. She's pregnant. They, they asked. There was a big rainstorm coming. They're like, can, can you keep her? you know, while this rainstorm goes over and, and so she doesn't stand in the muck and the cold and we're like, yeah, yeah, we'll take her. She has her lambs, two of them. And I notice she's not giving them any milk and I look at her bag and it looks like she has very old mastitis. Like, so a lot of scar tissue in her, in her udder. So she can't give milk to these babies. So then we're bottle feeding these babies every few hours while they're just hanging out in their house um, and then one day, so I guess he decided to get rid of them. This is so sad. I, I hear this, the sheep just going, bah, bah, and I'm like, okay, so there's a sheep back over here. And I, I look over, over the fence to their property. And I see out of this guy's truck, the sheep just leaps from the bed of the truck and he picks it up and tries to put it back in and it jumps out again. And I'm like, oh no, 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 no. What are you doing? So I guess he got it strapped down somehow because the next few minutes it's driving down the road and I just hear, Bleh, you know, as it's going down the road. So, yeah, I love my neighbors. I love them so much. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to say only in Texas, but we've all had neighbors. Like no. <laughs> you know, I, t I try to tell people about this particular area and they're like, oh, that's just the country. The co and I'm like, no, you don't know. This is different. <laughs> but, it's like the Twilight that Zone. Said, you know, I love, I love my ranch. My ranch is fantastic. It's very it would pretty be too. I mean, you millions, have it all decorated. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it'd be millions of dollars anywhere else in the world. So if I have to deal with the crazies a little bit, I, I, I guess it's an even trade. I'm, I'm still, jury's still out on you that know, one. You if, if Trump has any of that fencing left, you could just <laughs> put I it know. on both sides. <laughs> Right, yep. and then I'm gonna make my neighbors pay for it. <laughs> That's it. You can it's do gonna that be too. the best <laughs> wall. It's gonna be glorious. It's gonna be fabulous. I'm gonna make my neighbors. And they're enough, gonna right? pay it should for it. Should be high it. enough for yeah. the bull not to get back. <laughs> yeah. Let me guess. Totally. They have a thousand chickens too. Um. Yes, they have chickens and geese that also live in the roofless dog kennel. And then they they asked us one day, like, "Have you seen any coyotes around? We're losing a lot of chickens." I'm like. No. And, uh, you know, for one, we have a million donkeys, so we don't have coyotes. But two, we put our chickens in a coop. <laughs> yeah. They did, you know, there's more things that eat chickens than just coyotes. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. We have, we have a very pretty family of foxes that live in our backyard, basically. Wow. There's an arena right behind our house. And then right behind that's another field. And they live in the corner of that field, literally 100 yards from us. And it's mama, and it's mom and dad and two kids. And it is so much fun to see little red foxes playing together. Oh, they're how just cute. like little cats or dogs, you know, playing all the time out there. And uh, they're they're very cold. But I guarantee you, we don't, you know, it's, we, if we no had chickens. chickens, it'd be bad. No chickens. <laughs> so. no chickens. Well, if you did have chickens, I would be more than happy to lend you some guard donkeys. <laughs> they come up, the foxes come up and drink out of the horse's water bolts outside. Oh, my gosh. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it is kind of cute. Um, but anyway, <laughs> now, now, how are we supposed to switch gears from that into a show about chilling and using your energy to not upset your horse? How are we going to go think, from <laughs> I think the word we're looking for here is anyway. <laughs> anyway, well, let's, our do this. Let's, right? <laughs> let's do a transition. And we're going to get to a lot of listener questions. You had a ton of them. We're going to get to those. But I wanted here, too, because you also got to go to Arizona and you took Guthrie along. And there's been a lot of the longtime listeners that have been asking you about Guthrie. Guthrie was her road to the horse horse from what? How many years ago is that now? 
I nice. think I competed with him in 2015, so I picked him up in 2014. So okay. not that long no, ago. I, I, it seems years. like you've had him forever. Uh, but yeah. you had what problem? And you were riding Guthrie at this show in Arizona, so I'm assuming that you've at least somewhat uh, waylaid this problem. So tell us about what happened and what the fix was. Oh, my gosh. So he's moving better than he's ever moved. But uh, so Guthrie is really interesting. And I'm just now realizing that perhaps that he's probably always had his issues since I bought him. Um, so so when I when I got him, um, you know, he's a big buff ranchy quarter horse. And I noticed right off the bat that he uses his tail a lot. Like he kind of swishes his tail, not in a nasty way, but even from the first ride where, you know, everything's cool and we're chill and we're riding for five minutes. He really uses his tail when he moved forward. And he's always been a really choppy peg legged mover. But, you know, some some horses just aren't that great at moving. But it wasn't until I was almost through my year of training. I had a year to train him and then I was going to go to Road of the Horse and compete with him. Um, all of a sudden he went acutely lame. I couldn't even tell what it was. And we went down this years long rabbit hole first of trying to figure out what the heck was wrong. Um, it was in his front feet, both front feet. Uh, I've, I've tried to rule out laminitis and, and foot confirmation. I've tried to, you know, redo his feet, uh, you know, have him re make sure he's trimmed just so I've had natural trimmers like flown out from States away to come help me work on this horse. Uh, long story short, uh, we find out that it's, uh, most people say that the horse has navicular, which is, it's sort of a catch all term for what they now call caudal heel pain, uh, or, you know, navicular syndrome. Um, so, uh, I've done x-ray after x-ray and corrective shoeing after corrective shoeing and, um, very little has made a difference for road to the horse. I was able to get him sound and this is before I knew we were dealing with navicular issues. Um, we uh, we put some corrective shoeing on him. We injected his coffin joint, and I had him on a mild anti-inflammatory every day, uh, Prevacox. And he rode great. And I thought, we fixed it. He's done. Like, you know, we'll be able to wean him off this corrective shoeing. He's going to be great. And I, after Road of the Horse, I gave him a long time off. You know, he worked pretty hard. And... Um, when I brought him back up again, I just could not keep him sound. I could not do it. You know, um, I tried shooing him every four weeks instead of every six weeks and just nothing would do it. Finally, I bit the bullet and paid $2,000 and had an MRI done. And that revealed that he had significant changes in his navicular bursa and his navicular bone and also a lot of soft tissue um, issues. And it was pretty much doom and gloom. Um, you know, the guy there who's like top of his field MRI vet said, if it was just this issue, you could do this, you could do this surgery, you could do this treatment. If it was just this issue, you could do this. He goes, but he has both. And he pretty much sent me home with like, there's nothing you can do. Um, like it was such a frustrating moment because, uh, you know, I'd say, well, what do I, do I need to put him on stall rest? He's like, nah, just turn him out. You know, it, there was nothing. I had no suggestions for him. So I thought he was done. I thought I had to retire my horse at the age of five and that was it. And I was just really bummed out because this was going to be my forever, you know, my, my magnum opus masterpiece horse that I do all my finishing stuff on and showcase and, and I had to retire him. Um, so one thing I did ask that vet before I took him home is I said, well, can I try Osphos, which is this, uh, this injectable, you inject it in their bloodstream. It's supposed to help with uh, remodeling that, that area, but it also has an inflammatory, anti-inflammatory effect that they're not really sure why it does that. Um, but, it, but it's had some really positive results. A lot of people have used it. I think Tammy Schrantz has used it on her horse and had, you know, she's still shooting off that horse and he's like 18 years old. Um, but, uh, He's like, yeah, you can, you know, it was just more one of those things like, well, you know, good luck, but yeah, whatever floats your boat. So I took him home, turned him out, kicked him out to pasture and I thought we're, we're done. That's it. And finally I went and hauled him to my local vet. who's a really great vet and, and did the Osphos. But at this point I was not even thinking, oh, I'm going to ride him next week. I was just, I was just hoping he'd be comfortable in the pasture. Um, 
So I did the Osphos, and he said, I recommend you coming back in 60 days and chasing it with another shot. And then after that, you could go every six to eight months. And I said, okay. And during this time, I was noticing that this horse was like running across the pasture a lot more and just moving a lot better. And he seemed happier. And I thought, well, you know, that's great. He's happy in his retirement. And when I went back for the second shot, I kind of jokingly made a comment about riding. And my vet said, well, I thought it was your goal. I thought that was always your goal was to ride him again. And I was like, what? But the MRI. And he goes, ah. He goes, you know, those are going to, you you put any horse in an MRI and they're, they're going to find a lot of flaws and stuff. And so he said, yeah, you know, um, give him a couple of days after this shot, start riding him again, straight lines, blah, 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 blah. So I did. He's moving really good, which I'm, I was really uh, still not hopeful about because I've given him significant time periods off, started riding him again, thought we were good. And then he was starting to show discomfort again. And, but he kept riding really well. Um, and we did a couple other things. We did decide to go ahead and inject his cough and joint and his navicular bursa. And this horse, it's amazing. He's moving fantastic. I've never had him. And my vet's, you know, my vet's really excited and really happy with it. And last checkup we did, which was a few days ago, he says, you could do whatever you want with him. And wow, so amazing. it's... Now, is it, yeah. are these shots really expensive? Yes. It's oh, okay. like three to four hundred dollars a pop and so it was a lot of money to do yeah but it cost you a hell of a lot more than that doing all the testing and all the vets you did before that (laughs) yeah if you started with that it would have been a hell of a lot cheaper right exactly exactly and you know it was still pretty new at the time uh that guthrie first started doing this and i didn't even know that you know that's what we were dealing with um but he and one thing i've learned about him I think he's really a jerk. Um, he, he was out to a pasture one day. He was always lame. I, <laughs> yeah, I think he just felt uncomfortable. And that's why he was so nice before. Because um, he was out to pasture one day. And this Mustang that I have, that is like the sweetest, calmest, most awesome little Mustang, gets along with everyone, um, that Guthrie has lived with for several years, he just decided he didn't like him. And he started running him all over the pasture like, I'm going to murder you running him down. And I'm just like, my mouth, my jaw hit the floor. I'm like, what are you doing? He did this for several minutes. And then at the far corner, he decided he was done. And he came trotting across the diagonal of my pasture just so triumphantly. And he's throwing his front feet out there like a dressage horse. I'm like, man, I think you're really a jerk. And you just haven't felt good before. So that happens. <laughs> I, I, he might have bucked me off. It's like bringing you know, that before. horse home from the auction that the, when the drugs wear off. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Same thing. They break into. Well, he yes. looked good. He looked good doing his thing, and I'm so glad he's back. I really am because I know how heartbroken you were about that whole situation. Yeah, I'm still kind of you know I'm just I'm waiting for the other Cautiously shoe to drop. Optimistic. <laughs> I've been yeah. here before where I'm like I'm gonna I'm gonna start showing you again. I enter him in one class and I get him out of a stall and he's walking like an old man um like he never really outright limps like head bobbing limp but i i can just tell i can feel it and i it's one of those things that's like yeah i could probably get in front of the judge and get through this i'm like i'm not i if i know if i know you're uncomfortable i'm not doing that to you but i he's oh my gosh when i trot him now he's got these big movements with his shoulders and um i'm actually having to hold him back quite a bit which is just it's been wonderful Yay! Well, good for you. Yay! Easy, effective, and eco-friendly fly control starts with fly predators. Fly predators are the organic, natural way to dramatically minimize your fly problem. Learn more about fly predators and other Spalding Labs fly control solutions at Spalding, S-P-A-L-D-I-N-G, dash labs, dot com. All right, let's spend about uh, five minutes, Mary, on on your training tip, and then we'll go into some of these listener questions. I love how you have to give me a cutoff. I do. Because you know I'm gonna... I've, I've done this show long I enough with you, Mary. You I've there. done it long enough yeah. that I know that we could go all day. Real and I subtle. like hanging real, out real with you. Subtle. By the way, it's it's National Best Friends Day, by the way. So it's Aww. just appropriate that we're doing this show with you today. 
Oh, that makes me feel good. That well, just because I just insulted you, so I thought I'd make yes, you feel better. Horribly. I mean, <laughs> you can't put you can't put a cap on my expertise <laughs> mastery, but we'll try, I guess. Did you ever because, read you Reader's know. Digest, Mary? Yeah, well, way back in the okay, day. Okay, good. This is the Reader's Digest version of using your energy to change your horse's energy. Fine. Um, and we are going <laughs> to we are gonna get into this with our guest a little bit. So uh, one of the auditors, I can't remember who, tagged me in a post about, um, like, you, like, I can't remember the exact wording, but being able to lower your energy and how that might affect your horse's energy. And, and you know, it's just kind of something I've, I've sort of done for so many years that I, I kind of forgot that it might be something that people aren't as aware of. And so I think it's an, it's a really great topic. Kudos to whoever brought that up. Um, and, uh, so when I talk about like your energy versus the horse's energy, I think it's, it's something, uh, there, um, we feed off of our horses, our horses feed off of us. And one of the biggest things I see as a precursor to people falling off is them tensing up. And, uh, and so I always have to tell people, uh, you know, relax, relax, relax. I had to tell, I, I put my assistant on a colt last night and the colt kind of jumped and I saw her knees shoot up and her heels shoot up and I had to say heels down, relax, 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 relax. And it's not only to, uh, get your seat back grounded and centered, um, and, uh, over your horse, but, uh, it will, it will bring your horse down. You would be surprised at how many times letting go of the reins instead of snatching the reins will actually diffuse a situation. And it's totally opposite of our normal instincts. We want to kind of collapse our core, tense up, bring our knees up, bring our heels up. And then we have like this kind of electric seat. And so we do that. Then the horse feels like, oh, she's really scared too. And they, they freak out and then we freak out more and we just kind of feed off of each other until something really bad happens. And, um, I always draw to mind this, this picture that I have of this cowboy I saw riding years ago. And he did the, one of the coolest, examples of really good horsemanship I think I've ever seen. And, uh, and I always think about this when I'm starting young horses or I'm on a nervous horse and I was at this, um, it's called stock horse of Texas. So it's, uh, it's a ranchy Western event. We're doing, um, cow work. We're doing raining. We're doing ranch tra- trail ranch pleasure. And I was in Abilene. It's a lot of West Texas cowboys with their taco hats, riding around and, uh, we're on the warm up pen getting ready for the cow work. And, uh, all of a sudden this other trainer, a guy I know who's a little bit, you know, he's a little bit weird and, and acquires weird animals. He had picked up this, I don't know where he got it, but this hackney pony and cart thing. Um, and it's like the most foreign thing you can imagine at a West Texas cow horse show. <laughs> and so imagine a scooter coming across the parking lot in this cart and, and, you know, his little knees are going up and down and it's, it's making a commotion. Uh, well, I was on a three-year-old. I got a right off my horse. I have been in wrecks where horses exploded over carts. I'm not doing that again. So I got off my horse and I'm holding them. And a lot of horses just kind of started spooking and scattering and jumping every which way. And one in front of me, the, it was this horse, this guy was riding around and it started to really get upset and you could Uh-oh. tell, Meltdown. yeah, you, you could tell something bad was going to happen. So what the cool thing that this guy did, he did not touch his reins. He had a big loop slack in his rein. He didn't pick up his hand. He didn't touch his reins. He didn't grab the saddle horn. He didn't do anything. He didn't, he didn't like, you know, steer his horse around or anything. What he did is he relaxed. He completely deepened his seat in the saddle and just went like a sack of potatoes. Like he stayed center, but his whole body was relaxed and the horse jumped left and right. And instead of him opposing that energy and fighting, you know, by, by tensing up himself, he absorbed it all. Like he just kind of went with the horse. The horse jumped one way. He, you know, the horse was saying, I'm going to spook over here. And the guy just kind of went with him, stayed completely relaxed. The horse jumped the other way. He stayed with him. And after a while, the jump started getting really slow and smaller. And the horse just totally, and this all happened within a few seconds. So the horse just totally zinned out, mellowed out, 
and then just stood still, licked you, relax everything. And I Boy, thought, that man. takes years, though, because your natural yeah. reaction is just tense up and try not to die. Yeah, or <laughs> snatch on the rein. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, that because you're holding, kept... that's what you're using to hold on at that point. I mean, for, for most yeah. people, right? Because it's just your first reaction. Well, to grab it. when you're falling stop. and your yeah. first reaction, or you feel like you're going to fall, your first reaction is to hold on and grab something. <laughs> so, well, yeah. and like, um, so this cult I was putting my assistant on yesterday, um, I was flagging her. So I was the one driving the horse and she's sitting up there and I was having the horse make half turns and, you know, they're, they're feeling the riders wait for the first time. So sometimes they stop and make a turn and they get a little goosey. And she kept trying to grab the reins. And I said, you know, a lot of times if you snatch on that horse's face, you will create this energy that makes the horse go straight up or bolt forward. If you let them go, just let it go. Let the reins go. We're in a small pen. They're not going to go anywhere. Even if we were outside, there's an ocean on either side. You will stop eventually. Um, <laughs> but let them we'll go. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's an old Although when side. my pony bolts, my, Jennifer keeps saying, well, you know, he's only going to go so far. He's going exactly. to get at some point. You're going to run exactly. out of road eventually. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of times if the horse is scared and we grab that rein, and if we grab it the way we're grabbing it, like not, you know, if I feel like I got to, I got to diffuse the situation, bend this horse down, I have to tell myself in my head, slow, 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 slow to pick up, quick to release always. So even if my horse is really starting to go, I'm going to be efficient with my timing. I want to get it done quickly, but I have to have mo slow movements. I slide my hand down. I might have to pick up firm, but it's all slow, fluid as I can be because the minute I snatch on their mouth, they're going to think they're trapped. And if they don't think they can run, the next thing they do is fight. If you take away flight, they're going to fight. And the fight is, I'm going to buck you off. I'm going to spook sideways. I'm going to rear up. I'm going to flip over. So, so a lot of times, you know, if you, and you have, you, you only get this confidence if you've done this a lot. So, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those catch 22s, but, um, a lot of times before I go to pick up, I try to let them have their face. And instead of, snatching on their face or tensing up. I do the exact opposite of what my body wants to do. And that's relax, 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 exhale, push those heels down, absorb your horse's energy. Don't fight with them. And, uh, it's just takes practice and lots of hitting the ground, unfortunately, most of the time. <laughs> but, but in 20 years, if you have any bones left, you'll be fine. You'll be good. Exactly. When you're like 97, <laughs> you're going to be a, you know, you'll, you'll have it down. Yep. 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 Well, let's uh, let's go to a. Qu I liked Allison's question here, and Allison trains mustangs too. And by the way, welcome Allison as, as our newest auditor as of a couple days ago. Um, she said, "When start and this is a good question." She said, "When starting a young horse, do you worry about leads at the canter in the beginning or just moving forward? My mustang is just starting under saddle and will not pick up the left lead. Should I try and fix it now or just work on forward movement? Any exercises to help get him the correct lead?" It's a good question. That's a great question. And it's one I've kind of gone back and forth with over the years. So um, I like that she understands that forward is essential. Um, and, you know, all back to this energy and scary cults and everything. If you can get a horse moving forward, you are going to prevent a lot of trouble. And I don't mean fast, just moving out. Um, so my general rule is, I will sacrifice other things in order to get forward. So that might be the horse's lead or his inside bend or whatever. If, you know, I want to make sure we get forward first. That said, the way I used to start Colts, I would not care about their leads for like 30 days. Because in my mind, well, you know, for those first 30 days, they're not going to know what hip control is or advanced hip control that it takes to set, you know, I'm not going to be able to pick up that shoulder with that inside let your rein and, and do all this and that the other. So I'm not going to teach them leads. And I used to let them lope around on whatever lead they wanted to. Well, when it came time to, I put enough body control on that horse and I'd say, okay, we're going to work on leads. It was always a huge fight. I always had one lead I couldn't get. Um, and what I had essentially let happen is that horse got really good at rope loping the wrong direction on the wrong lead. So they kind of find a balance in that. And so the, there's nothing really compelling them to find the correct lead. And so I always got into fights with them. I could just never guarantee I'd have the correct lead every time. 
And so what I've learned and, and I, and, uh, a great, uh, example of this that really helped my mind getting, um, get wrapped around it is, uh, I was at a Buck Branham in clinic several years ago and we were asking about cantering and, uh, we asked the same question, do you care about leads? And he says, yeah, first ride, I want him on the correct lead. And so we're kind of like, well, how do you do that? Because he doesn't know. He, I can't even steer him at this point. How do I get the correct lead? And he told us, he said, you need to find out what lead your horse is in in the trot and what lead your horse is in in the walk, which I'm like, well, that their feet don't No, They don't, they don't have leads. And, and, but he explained it. If I'm trotting across the pasture, across my arena, you can feel, especially if you've ridden a number of colts and, and young horses, you can feel like if I were to ask for the canner now, they would pick up this lead. Or if I were to ask for it over here by the barn, they'd pick up this lead. No matter how balanced your horse is, you're, they're going to be kind of favoring one side or the other. And I'm actually going to use things like the barn or the arena gate or corners in my arena to help figure out what lead I'm going to get. So I may not have hip control. I may not have collection. I may not have all these like little buttons in order that I think I need to get the correct lead, but I can use my timing. So as I'm trotting around and say the far corner of the arena, usually they come off of that far corner. Let's say if I'm traveling to the right, going around that, that the top left corner of the arena, almost always, if you ask for it there, you're going to get the right lead almost always. And there's things you can do to help them. You can open up your inside hip, weight, your left stirrup a little bit more look up. That's a big thing. I will lift the inside rein, even if it doesn't really do anything. I think it kind of lifts my body up and it sort of frees them up. And, and then I ask for it. And, um, I'm almost always at this point able to get the lead I'm thinking about. If they don't get it, I'm not going to punish them. I'm not going to like break them down and twirl them around because they don't know. I'll just kind of allow them with my energy to go back to a trot and then I will find another spot and I'll try again. And I don't push the issue. If I think it's going to be a fight, I will sacrifice getting the correct lead. It's not that big a deal, but I'm going to start planting that seed in my horse's head. When you're going left, we're going to be in the left lead. When you're going right, we're going to be in the right lead. And I'm going to be like a lawyer. The, one of the number one rules in, in being a lawyer, uh, being a trial lawyer, is you don't ask a question you don't already know the answer to. So I'm never going to ask for that lead if I'm not sure what lead I'm going to get. I'm going to wait for the opportunity. It might take me five minutes of trotting around before I'm like, yep, I bet I could get this lead if I ask now. And initially, you're only able to get the correct lead in certain places. But if you only ask the question when you're going to get the right answer and you get your horse in the habit of giving you the right answer over and over and over again, pretty soon you can ask that question anywhere and you'll get the answer you're looking for. Then later on, all the body control and collection is going to come in. Plus, one more thing, that's going to make your lead changes a lot easier because if I have a horse for the first maybe six months of training, he's gotten in a habit of when we're left, we're going on the left lead. When we're going right, we're on the right lead. Then one day I might say, okay, we're going to go on the right lead and turn left. He's going to think if he's only, if he's gotten so used to just keeping the correct lead, he's going to feel uncomfortable loping in the wrong lead, going the wrong direction. So then I, all I usually have to do at that point is switch my way and say, hey, would, do you want to pop into the other lead? And they're usually like, oh, thank you. Okay. And it's very easy to get lead changes at that point. But if you've let him for months and months just do whatever lead he wants, he's going to get very, very good and very balanced at giving you a counter canner or incorrect lead. Glenn's on, t Glenn's on mute and he's talking merrily oh, over there, but I agree sorry. completely. <laughs> I, I, I think I made that. Oh yeah. This wasn't the one you gave me a time cap on. I, I was looking at the clock and I freaked out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> Um, now she's so scared that I'm going to threaten her. I body. know. You need to have like a buzzer. <laughs> I do. I do have buzzers. Like could, a Simon uh, Cowell buzzer. I have one of those. I could, I could, yes. uh, I could help you. There's one question before we, uh, we, we have to take another break. And that is, uh, how can, uh, Carly wants to know how she can teach her chicken to play the Star Spangled Banner. That is actually a terrific question. The answer is, <laughs> it, it really is actually. Well, did you see so, that by the way? Yes. yes. So the backstory of this, uh, you know, she's not crazy 
most of the time. Carly's only semi crazy. Yeah, she's a know. little crazy. Crazy enough to yeah. be an auditor. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think it was Carly who posted a video of this chicken on, was it America's Got Talent? It's America's Got Talent from two weeks ago. Yeah. They have oh, some really gosh. good ones this year. And, and that was just really bizarre. Do. <laughs> that one was amazing. So these two women get up there with their chicken and they're going to say, they say, oh, our chicken will play the Star Spangled Banner. And so they're like, okay, go for it. And they put the chicken down. And for like a solid, I don't know, 15 seconds, this chicken was doing nothing. And I was just oh, like, was oh my gosh. Something. It was preening itself, licking his butt. Yeah. <laughs> and they kept having to like push it over to the piano. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be a disaster. And then all of a sudden when the chicken was like, okay, I'm, I'm pretty and it's go time. It just hammered out the entire Star Spangled Banner in one go, um, which was crazy. And so what they oh, most likely, I'm almost 100% positive um, used with that chicken was positive reinforcement because if you've ever tried to get a chicken to do anything okay. with like... You have a better chance of getting the cat to play the Star Speckled Band. Exactly. <laughs> well, here's a funny story. So they have, and I think it's on the East Coast, they've all over the country, these chicken training camps. And you train a chicken, they have several different courses, but you'll train a chicken to like do an agility course, like weave poles. You are making go, this up. Nope. I'm not. Um, and I really want to do it, but it's like three grand. Um, For a to chicken tra training camp? To tra yes. And, and here's the reason you're doing chickens. It's a lot of dog trainers do this. And I think it'd be terrific for horse trainers too. Um, and the reason dog trainers are learning to train chickens instead of going to, say, a dog training camp is um, you're going to have a lot of preconceived habits if you want to change your, a lot of dog trainers who want to change to positive reinforcement or learn positive reinforcement, you come to it with a lot of bad habits. Like, you know, oh, I'm, I'm going to pull on your leash to get you to do this. And the thing about dogs is dogs want to please us. They're very smart. Um, so they'll go along with it. But a chicken is not so. They have a short attention span. They don't, na they're not naturally inclined to please anybody but themselves. And you can't like, Put a choke chain on a chicken. You can try. It's not going to work. It's going to be. You're going to have a bad time if you do that. Um, so, so they they're able to like form these new good habits using this sort of clean slate and getting a chicken to do all of this stuff. And chickens, uh, it's amazing what ch they have gotten chickens to do. And the Star Spangled Banner is one of them. And what essentially this is is to me, it looks like what I would call a behavior chain. So obviously they didn't put sheet music in front of the chicken and say, okay, here's your music. Have it memorized by America's Got Talent. They taught the chicken Are to target. Sure? A, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I mean, maybe I'm not a chicken trainer or anything, but <laughs> so, you know, they taught it to target the first key and probably clicked and treated. And they got that behavior to happen over and over and over again. They probably put it on some sort of cue. Either it's a visual cue, like the chicken sees a certain mark on the piano or, or whatever. And then what they probably did is taught it to target a new key and then did that over and over and over again. And then what they started to do was link those two keys together. So you target you touch this one and then this one and then get a click. And then they just keep adding that new link on the chain. Now do this key, this key, and this key. Now this key, this key, this key, and this key. And you can, you can build those chains um, up to really high numbers. And it's something I actually do in horse training. And I just did a version of it this uh, uh, last week when I went to Arizona. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, you can train a horse to do this behavior, then two behaviors, then three behaviors, all in a row for one click um, and one food reward. It's pretty cool. So, yes, totally possible. Here and, I thought uh, this, uh, that you were just going to say, I don't know how they did that. But you actually came up with a training solution for it. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, totally the thing possible. is, and we talked about this with Jamie the other day, chickens, we had chickens, everybody's had chickens knows this, chickens find 85 ways to die prematurely. They yes. must be keeping <laughs> this chicken in like a gold cage, uh, completely immune from other chickens and any wrap. outside influences to, so that this chicken can make it to the finals. <laughs> what I would do is have many, many backup chickens. Yeah, yes. you better have something. <laughs> I think that's and the key. Can they use a backup chicken? I don't know. You know? I don't know. Who's going to know? That's the actual contestant right there. 
Yeah, so, who's going to know? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think this was good, good for ratings for, <laughs> for America. Yes. Do you think Simon just drools when, when, when an act like that that he knows is going to fail actually works? And he goes, oh, God, this is going to go so viral. They just pray for this. Um, yeah. yeah. The, the only thing I'm not that would really impress me is if that chick- chicken had more than one song in his repertoire. Well, we're going to find <laughs> out when the chicken comes back. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Can't play the See, same one. what they should have done is say he's going to play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, and then Mary Had a Little Lamb, and like all those songs that have the same melody, and no one would be the wiser. Oh, that's true. Look at you, musical, <laughs> yes. talented Mary, I'm picking supposed- up on that. Oh, did well, I not tell you I played clarinet for six years? <laughs> well, you know, my mom and dad met playing clarinet in the band. We we're married for, for like 40 years after that. Oh. So take up clarinet again, Mary. You'll find, your, you'll find the love of your life. Uh, I know a lot of clarinet players and that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, take a break and we'll come back and we'll do another question before we get to our guest. Recharge your training program with Equestrian Plus. Equestrian Plus brings together top riders, trainers, and professionals onto one video platform. Watch over 5,000 how-to training videos, clinic and event footage, exclusive training sessions, and more featuring top experts including five-time dressage Olympian Stefan Peters, five-time Olympic show jumper Ann Krasinski, Olympic eventer and silver medalist William Foxpit, and more. Join Equestrian Plus now and use promo code HRN15 for 15% off your first month. Visit equestrianplusplus.com to subscribe. All right, let's uh, let's do another one. Which one do you want to handle? Which one do we have time for here? You want to take Ooh, next? Um, oh, this is so hard. Um, okay, uh, here's a good one. Uh, last minute question. Uh, Stephanie Eileen said, tried doing the tarp thing, folded up small, got to be able to rub him with it, open it somewhat on his back, but couldn't for the life of me get him to put a foot on it. No matter what I did, he'd get close, but then not step on it. I stood on it. I pulled him forward. I real eased, released pressure, pressure, (laughs) released pressure and praised for getting closer. But that's it to the point where he'd be drawing a compass circle around us with his butt. Um, Okay. That's a very good one. I find that horses fall into two categories with the tarp. One of two categories generally. Either they're really cool with you touching them with it or they're really great about walking over it. I I don't always have one that's great with both right off the bat. Um, So with the uh, tarp, one of the things that you need to have on the ground is pretty decent foot control. So this is more than just... Well, I can get my horse to go in some circles around me and I can lead him from point A to point B and he sort of backs up sometimes. Um, really work on, can I move your hip one step? Now, can I bring your hip back? Can I move your hip two steps? Can I move it four steps? Um, can I move your shoulder? Can I move your rib cage? Can I get you to back off easily? Can I get you to come forward off of halter pressure? If you have those things in place, it becomes much, much easier to get your horse to put his feet on the tarp or trailer or whatever is spooking him. So if I can direct my horse's uh, feet with 100% precision, that's going to be impossible, but that's the goal. That's what you have, you know, on a pedestal is I can be able to put my horse's feet anywhere I want them, when I want them, 100% of the time. And you can take that power and put his feet over and around and through things. Um, The other thing um, I see that is a really bad habit of people trying to get their horses over and on to obstacles is they get in front of the horse and they pull them. Um, Really bad idea, uh, one, for safety, because say you're on the tarp, standing in front of the tarp, trying to get your horse to come on the tarp. You pull him onto the tarp. He steps on it. It makes a noise he doesn't like. A lot of times the next step is them jumping in the air and on top of you. So don't get in front of your horse when doing this. Another reason this doesn't work um, is you might be able to get your horse to follow you over an obstacle. um, But the problem is when you get on, I've seen this happen. People can lead their horse through an obstacle if the horse is behind them, but then they get on and the horse won't go. Well, he has nothing to follow now. So I get in the habit of being able to send my horse, drive them over an obstacle. So I'll stand behind their shoulder and um, 
point at the tarp and then use some driving energy from behind to get them to go over. That's going to be more similar to the energy I'm going to use when I ride. Um, Another thing that I will do, if a horse is just, I know they're going to have a huge problem with it. Usually by the time I get a tarp out and throw it on the ground, my horses all walk on it. But I've, this is what I've done. Instead of just getting a green horse out and saying, please get on this tarp, I work on, can I move your hips? Can I move your shoulders? Can I get you to back up? Can I get you to come forward? Can I get you to side pass? Can I get you to go, go, to go in a circle this way? Can I do this at any gate I want, any speed I want? Then by the time I throw a tarp on the ground, I have such good control with my horse and my horse understands my cues so well that it's a, it's a tiny, tiny issue to get them to cross the tarp. It's not a huge deal at all. Um, but every once in a while you get one that's just got a phobia. So what I will do is I will fold the tarp into, um, like horizontal wise into, uh, m- you know, a million times until the tarp is like pencil thin. So I've got a long skinny tarp and I will ask my horse to cross over it. Like I would a ground pole. It's a lot easier for them to go over it if they can see the other side clearly and they might jump over it and that's okay. We'll keep crossing it until they just step over it easily. And then each time, uh, my horse successfully does that then I will unfold it just once. So now that little, I had a, like a skinny, maybe six inch wide tarp. Now it's like 10 inches wide and they'll cross and I'll get them to cross it several times. And then I'll unfold it one more and then one more and then one more. And by the time you get it to where your horse has to step on the tarp to cross, um, they have crossed over it so many times. You're going to have a much better chance of getting them over that tarp without too much issue. Very good. Jennifer, anything to add to that? I totally, um, driving the horse over versus leading him over. I think that's where most of us go wrong. It's, it's at the beginning. And now that the horse has learned to circle around it, like a wagon wheel, now we have to back up because now he's already learned what he thinks is the correct way to do it. And that's another thing is, and and when I say leading, you can lead your horse over, but I make sure that I'm not in front of the horse with them leading behind me. I'm standing either at or slightly behind their shoulder and we're going over together. So you can lead them over in that aspect. Um, Again, it's a big safety thing. And, and when you do, when, if you do lead a horse over in that way, be prepared to block them. Sometimes they will decide not to cross the tarp and instead run over you. So be ready to kind of throw a hand up, create some energy. Um, you know, my rule is you don't have to cross, but don't run over me. Um, yeah. And, you know, and that's another thing. Do not put pressure on them at the tarp. If I have trouble getting them forward, I'll move them away from the tarp, work on our go button, and then I will create a lot of energy, maybe 10 or 15 feet from the tarp. And I like to release them at the tarp, let them smell it, let them take their time. I, I'd rather release my horse over an obstacle than yeah. wail on them over yeah. an obstacle. Because then they associate the, the yeah. obstacle with the pressure. And something that if you have to back up even further, because I've spent most of my life working with remedial horses, I've had rarely had the opportunity to start with a blank slate is if the horse cannot go happily, comfortably, and confidently over a ground pole, maybe you need to start there first because a ground Ooh. pole is going to be a lot less intimidating. Yes. And if and you can take a teensy-weensy baby step towards tarp by going from ground pole to a two-by-six plank instead of a ground Ooh, pole because that's a piece one. of wood that's wide, but it makes that piece of wood sound, if I touch it, a little bit less scary. And add visual volume to the obstacle in micro steps and that might be of of good use if you have a horse that's in that remedial phase of tarp he's already decided you know this is the way i deal with tarp and now you have to back up a little bit you can also buy a i have one of these it's yellow but it's a canvas tarp so (gasps) yes because it was here Yeah, it won't make the crunchy crunchy as bad. It'll still be an odd sensation for them to step over it, but it's just like one if you can if you can break it down and take it one step back, you know, like we talked about this last month, behavior lumping versus behavior splitting. So crossing over a big open scary tarp can actually be a thousand tiny behaviors. So just, you know, break it down, break it down, break it down. All right, yeah. very good. Well, let me give your guest a call, and then you can introduce him. Once we get him on, we're gonna actually be calling him live today. So, uh, it, 
and hopefully we uh, we can round him up. And you know that uh, whole tarp thing. When if you went to Road to the Horse, you see that played out on, in every competition. Hello, hello, James. Yes, and this is Glenn, and you're on Horses in the Morning. I'm here with Mary and Jennifer. I, I hope you're well this morning. I am well. It's a beautiful day in Western Massachusetts. Okay, where I cool. happen to be today. Cool. Well, Jennifer, yeah. Mary's going to introduce you. We haven't done that yet, so go ahead, Mary. Um, so I brought James Shaw on to talk about the, uh, you know, we kind of got this theme going of energy and using your energy and working with the horse. And uh, James works with equestrians and his unique background is uh, he's he's got, uh, he's an expert in martial arts, including Tai Chi. Um, so if you would, can you tell us a little bit about your background in martial arts and how that led you to work with riders? Sure. Um, first of all, I, um, I, um, I, uh, I don't consider myself an expert. I am a lifelong student, and uh, I always think the minute I become an expert, I'm no longer a student. Um, however, um, I have a lot of experience. So um, I first started um, in martial arts back in 83, and it was more of a um, kind of a spiritual quest, if you will. Um, it was just something missing in my life that I thought um, that I thought this uh, kind of mystic kung fu uh, stuff that I'd seen on TV would uh, would would be the missing link. So basically, I studied um, a kung fu system where they did tai chi and and a a harder style, we would call it, uh, of Kung Fu. And I was, most of my time was spent um, at what we would call a Kung Fu temple because it was a spiritual, uh, you know, we looked at uh, the, the mental, emotional, spiritual side as much as the physical side of the art. Um, it was a healing art. It was taught as a healing art and a fighting art. And that's where the Tai Chi came in. There was a tremendous amount of um, uh, Chinese medicine involved with with uh, Tai Chi. So I spent 15 years there, and that was in Long Beach, California. Um, and I was there, but, you know, for the most part, about six days a week, six hours a day. So I completely dedicated my life to learning and then being able to teach this um, system of Kung Fu. And like so many things, the master kind of became a guru and wasn't really teaching anymore. And it was more about business. So I, I, I had to leave. And when I left, uh, which I thought was a horrible thing to happen in my life, which turned out to be the best thing that ever happened in my life. Um, when I left, I met a little Chinese lady. I say little because she was tiny. Um, and I was much, much bigger, stronger, and faster than she was. And um, she, she taught um, Tai Chi. And um, I had heard that she was a phenomenal teacher. So I went to her and she, um, well, the first thing that she said to me was, you have some of the best bad habits I've ever seen. And I'm not going to be able to, to teach you because people don't change these bad habits. She said, you've perfected them over 15 years. Um, and I think I started crying. Uh, not really, but I was just distraught. And um, I finally convinced her if she could at least show me what the bad habits were. Um, and, and then if I couldn't change them, you know, I understood, but I did. And everything that she taught me, um, and flowed back into what I learned at this other school. And it's those lessons, it's those techniques um, that I that I use to work with riders. Um, there are some things that, you know, in my previous school, I thought I knew because I understood the philosophy. And I could tell you what the application of the philosophy was. But in my body, I never really developed the ability because 
I was still using force against force. I wasn't receiving the force of the opponent, if you will, um, the energy, if you will, um, and letting it uh, move through my body into the earth and then redirecting it. Um, and that, um, yeah, that that subject right there is is uh, what I think is really amazing because uh, I've I've read on your website you're talking about force and against force and um, I wondered if that was a concept that was more specific to Tai Chi than other martial arts and it's something that when I read that exact force against force term I thought oh my gosh this is with the horses this is like one of the biggest problems and it's and it's something i have to overcome of uh and we talked about this a little bit earlier about when my horse um decides to spook or bolt or buck i tend to instead of just sort of absorbing that or yielding to it i, I tend to fight back i want to grab on my horse's face and i just mm. wanted to point that out i thought that was a really interesting point and and definitely a cool relationship between horsemanship and, and martial arts yeah, and it's it's you know I um my experience is, is that even most Tai Chi that we're gonna learn um does not really under you know it's it it's like the teachers don't necessarily understand you know what it means to receive and redirect force they they don't know it in their physical body they certainly know it intellectually. They certainly know that I, you do this and I do this, you know, like the techniques, but, um, just like riding, there's, you know, in the area that I'm visiting this week, um, there are a hundred riding instructors in a 20 mile radius, but they're not all, you know, and they all teach riding, but they don't all teach it the same. So, um, the martial art, while yes, there are some martial arts that we are vested in using force against force. And all that means to me is if you, if you do choose the path of force against force, then you have to be bigger, faster, and stronger than the force you're opposing or else you wear down very quickly. And in riding, you know, that force is, a, is the power of a horse. And, you know, I'm a big, strong guy, but the smallest mini is bigger, faster, and stronger than I am. You know, so let alone another, uh, you know, um, a horse that we would ride. So that, um, to me, it's um, it's really important to understand for, for clarity, for long-term clarity, that the first two forces that I define, because we have to define it otherwise, um, you know, it's it could be a misunderstanding of force or energy. So the first two forces are the power of the horse that's created when the hind feet push into the earth and the earth pushes back. And I think they call it earth resonance force. And, you know, uh, that's what pushes back. It's that force that we get to receive through our sit bones. Hopefully that force we remove the blocks in our body and that force carries through our skeleton and eventually back to the horse and the force of gravity. So we look at those two forces and when you control those two forces, um, it, it actually seems quite magical because it, it's, you know, a horse that's never moved this way, all of a sudden moves this way effortlessly. And I think that's the, for me, the, you know, and they're all words, you know, it's not anybody can use the word effortless, but when you get in line with these two forces, gravity and the power of the horse, things become effortless because there's no separation between you and the horse. And again, like I said, that's very, that could be very philosophical and it'd be a nice title for a book, but the techniques and the applications and the, the, development of the ability to apply these principles um, is where the, the true difference comes in. And I don't know it, if, um, um, I don't know if this relates, but um, one of the things that I've always kind of, it's been a word that's floated around horsemanship and a lot of people use it. And I think a lot of people misunderstand it is 
feel. And you've got people like Ray Hunt who talk about a feel, following a feel, and you've got to use feel and timing and and all of this. And it's something that I've always felt um, I've always had a, uh, I've always had a certain feeling about can't put it into words. It's almost tangible and, and almost like you were saying, it's, it's almost magical. And then I had someone ask me, well, what does feel like define it for me? And I totally could not do that. And I was wondering if that was something that you've come across. Do you, do you, uh, have a concept of your own, a feel that you can define, put into words for people to understand? And does that relate to all of this that we're talking about? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I love that you think about feel that way. Um, I, I, um, I'll, I'll tell a very short story about it. I was working with a, a world-class rider and um, her daughter, who was also a very high level rider said that um, she was commenting on, on feel. And she said, that's why it takes 20 years to develop this feel. Now, I had just started working with riders, and I'd come out of this working with this um, phenomenal, her name is Wen Mei Yu, um, Tai Chi teacher. And, um, I, and I, I, did, I couldn't say anything because my mind is saying that you don't know what you're talking about. Because <laughs> in Tai Chi, we, we start to, and not, not arrogantly or rudely, but just like, oh, that, that's, that's, that's an uneducated, naive view of it. Um, cause in Tai Chi, we teach feel from the first moment and, um, it, it is so, um, defined like feel is a product of what in the West we would call our right brain, our creative mind that that's where, I mean, there have been studies that, that will show the brain firing, you know, um, fantastically on the right side when you engage in these exercises to, to create feel, if you will. So, and the Chinese call it the yi mind, Y-I, yi mind, which is, is, is maybe roughly translated to spirit mind. So the left brain that would like to figure feel out and make a, a mathematical formula for it, if we're doing that, we, 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 we're not even in the right part of the house right to find it so yeah feel and sensitivity can be developed but it first starts with an expanded awareness of ourselves in other words um i have to feel where my weight is where gravity is if you will in my feet and be able to feel wow my right foot feels heavier has more contact on the ground um that's how you develop feel. It's, uh, I believe it's much more efficiently and quickly um, developed on the ground. And then you already have it to apply in the saddle. I think we get confused sometimes or we think that I have to ride more to develop feel. I just have to do it more to develop feel. And it's not really like that. It's almost a skill that is teachable and developed. And you can develop it. But knowing that, you know, you have to expand your awareness, you have to completely postpone judgment, um, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, you have to expand your awareness, and you have to be really quiet, and you have to listen. I almost think feel is, um, is uh, it, it, the, the word even falls short, because to me, feel is... Uh, listening. It's listening to myself. It's listening to my body. It's being aware of these subtle changes of weight. Even while my foot's flat on the ground, my weight could be in the heels or it could be in the ball of the foot. Now, most of my students, when we initially do these, you know, training feel, they feel their heels on the ground and they think, or they feel the ball of the foot on the ground, you know, right? the heel and the ball. And they think their weight's in the balls of the feet because they're thinking about the ball of the foot and their awareness is on the ball of the foot, but the weight's actually in the heel. So we do this little push thing and they immediately go back in their heels. So it's things like that that develop feel. So it's absolutely, um, it's one of the things that I quietly believe I go around doing is increasing people's feel and sensitivity by distracting them from their thinking mind. 
right? The strand, this goes into, you know, I, I have uh, some dear friends who are, they just do liberty work. They are so into it. And I get to work with them on feeling their own weight shift. You know, we feel, we usually feel our weight shift in pounds, you know, tens of pounds. Um, but horse, horses see weight shift in ounces. And if we don't know, you know, if we're not aware of that, because, you know, I don't fall down when I walk, so I'm doing pretty good. Um, but I think horses see it in, and react to it. And then because we're unaware of the reaction of the horse to some shift in our body, um, and unfortunately, sometimes that shift of the horse's reaction, we, uh, with good intent, we people that don't understand it call, start calling it energy. I raised my energy. I did this, or I, you know, and and then I I want to go. Oh, but did you know your weight shifted to the left and you dropped your shoulder, and the horse did the same thing. Oh wow! So it absolutely relates to feel, um, and, and in, in, you know, Tai Chi, which I don't teach Tai Chi as the form anymore to, to, to my riding clients and my golf clients. I teach them these things. I teach them the things that really make Tai Chi or internal martial arts, which Tai Chi is one of them, really make it work effortlessly meaning that I do not have to get stronger if my horse starts to buck. I have to actually relax more so I can, if you will, take that that big push of force into my spine and get rid of it through my spine because anywhere I tighten up, um, that force is now just going to push me. I'm going to go with it, kind of like getting caught in a wave. You know, you can go under the wave or you get, caught with it and it drags you up on the beach. If you go under it, you pop up on the other side and, and you weren't, you know, caught in that force. So that feel um, it, it is a it is a byproduct. Well, no, it's not a byproduct, but it's the product of a heightened sense of awareness and this ability to um, question what we believe we know. For instance, my, and, and I so I'd um, talk about it later. When people think their weight's in the balls of their feet, they, they kind of, they go, no, I can feel it. It's right there. But then I put two ounces of pressure on them and that two ounces puts their whole body back in their heels. Their weight was in their heels, but their mind didn't think so. Their thinking brain, their left brain didn't think it was. Um, but all of a sudden, you know, with no force, I mean, two ounces, what is that? A half a stick of butter? You know, we have a saying in, in uh, well, it, it's physics, but it's also martial art, and that you can redirect the force of a 1,000 pounds with four ounces of pressure. And I say that, and then I say, if your aids are ever more than four ounces, and that doesn't always sink in because the left brain is thinking about four ounces, but four ounces is a stick of butter in the U.S. You know, we buy a pound of butter, it's, it's a quarter stick of butter. And I ask them to hold that weight in their hands, you know, like picture a stick of butter in your hands. And then I go, are your weights, at, are your aids, leg, rain, seat, any heavier than that? Then we're using force. Wow. So that's, you know, that, that's, it, it, it's, it's, it's pretty intense, but I, meaning, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's we, we, we teach feel and in teaching feel, by expanding our awareness of ourselves, being able to say, well, I think I know, but maybe I don't, is a fantastic state to be in with all of this stuff, whether you do liberty or you're riding, you know, upper level competitive dis- dressage. My, that Chinese um, lady, Wen Mei Yu, uh, she used to tell me <laughs> quite often, as I remember, and she would say, if you think you know, you're unteachable. And the first couple of times, because I came in with 15 years of experience, um, I thought I knew. I mean, I should know. I've been doing this for 15 years, six hours a day, six days a week, dedicated my life to it. And, you know, yeah, you learn something. Um, but she was, 
saying that what I learned was not the whole truth, you know, but I believed it was. So in believing it was, I, I was not open to her teaching. And uh, it's very funny because she told me that uh, for a long time. And after um, after a few months, I thought, you know, she, she was 68. So she was 70 um, by the time we were getting into the depth of this training. And I thought, she's getting old. And it's either her favorite saying or she forgot. She told me, if you think you know you're unteachable last week. <laughs> so one day I walked out and I went, oh, my God. Every time she's telling me, she's observing that I think I know what she's talking about, there, but, I, but I don't really, and I'm unteachable. So that's a huge lesson that I try to, you know, just instill in people because most of the folks I work with, um, they have, they've ridden for years before they get to me. Once in a while, I get people who have just, but... I'm not really a, a riding instructor. You know, I'm not a, I don't consider myself, uh, we'll put it this way. You know, I don't start people riding and I'm not a horse trainer. I, I, I kind of train people and I just happen to train them in the saddle to deal with this force greater than themselves, gravity and the horse. But I don't, um, so what I'm saying is that the people that come to me and the folks that are probably listening, you know, they're, they've already achieved a, a, a really high level and a depth of knowledge in what they do. And it's, you know, the, the, that can actually be an anchor that slows us down or drags us holding on to an idea that we think we know instead of being open, open-minded and go, Maybe I don't really know what, and you were so perfect when you said it, when you tried to define feel. You know, if you can't define feel, it's like, well, maybe, maybe, well, maybe I don't know that as much as I thought about it. Yeah, and you, you know, um, oh, yeah, and, and I've had a few moments of this uh, horse training, you know, I, I had been training for several years, and I thought, you know, I'm pretty darn good. And, and I had a guy, uh, a very good trainer ask me, um, he was asking a group of us at a clinic. He said, well, tell me what happens when the horse is cantering. And it took me a few seconds to kind of like, I had to kind of almost put my hands out and like, oh yeah, this foot does this. And, and he just looked at me, he's, you're a horse trainer and you can't explain this. So you don't really know. And, and so I had to really, you know, sit back and think, oh my gosh, that's a, that's kind of a basic concept that I've been riding a canter for years and years and years, but I didn't really know what one was. And, and, uh, so I, yeah. I, I think as a horse trainer, you definitely, uh, or, or anything that you've been doing for a while, you hit those moments. Of course, the, the moment you're the, you're most confident is when you learn a little, like in the very beginning, you learn a little and, um, uh, you know, it's, it's what I call being at the top of Mount stupid, you know, that's when your confidence is really high uh, and you think, you know, everything. And then all of a sudden you're hit with the weight of all that you don't know and you shoot all the way down and then you slowly build your confidence back up over time. But yes. And, and, and that feel question, someone just, cause, cause most of, most people in, in my circle of horsemanship, this whole natural horsemanship movement, and they sort of revere mm -hmm the guys that, that started this. And, and these guys were, when you were talking about your Tai Chi instructor, it kind of reminded me of, of like Ray Hunt and Tom Dorrance and that they always seem to talk in riddles and they would never just like take someone by the shoulders and shake their shoulders and say, this is what I'm trying to tell you. They would almost, they would just say something over and over and over again. And I've heard almost an identical antidote, uh, anecdote of a young writer thinking, well, this guy's really old and he's kind of lost it. And maybe I caught him at the end of his days and I'm not really going to get all the best knowledge from him. And then years later, they're hit with the realization of, oh, he was trying to tell me this the whole time. And I was just too ignorant to see it. And and I, th I thought that's kind of a cool parallel between what you're going through and what I've, uh, you know, what I've experienced and what others have experienced. But with, you know, on the concept of feeling, you know, it's almost kind I've almost find a kind count found the term to be like an emperor's new clothes type of deal where like if you have to ask then you don't know and then finally someone did ask like no really tell me what it is and I 
was kind of like, oh, um, <laughs> it's this thing that you have. And, and it was very difficult exactly. to actually explain. It. Yeah. Because um, I would, I, um, I, I totally agree with, uh, you know, the, the emperor's new clothes, um, scenario. And, and I, um, I used to use that quite a bit because, you know, it's rampant in the martial arts world where, where somebody that might look the part and, uh, you know, they speak in riddles and, uh, which, which quite often means that they don't know how to teach it, you know, meaning like when, when somebody says feel and, uh, you know, uh, we say, well, it takes years to develop or it's that, that's, that's true if we don't know how to teach it. Right. And, and this happens quite a bit like the canter, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you can't explain like what you're see, I'll give you a very, very specific, um, scenario. Um, I, because martial arts, we, the, one of the first principles is all movement comes from the, the center and the center is synonymous with your seat and riding. But beyond that, what it means is your center is your, your pelvis, your sacrum and lumbar spine and your femur bones. So those, let's say four bone structures are depending on how you count, uh, those bones are your center. They are your seat. Um, and the bones are important, more important than the muscle, more important than, you know, flexibility. The bones are important because they are what transfers the force of gravity and the force of the horse through your body, right? Bones transfer force, muscles don't. So when I define it, like these bones are your center, Either you can use them the way they were completely reused them the way they are designed, or we get by. And so in the canter, if I think, okay, explain canter, not just what the horse is doing, but what is, you know, and maybe I'm a little mental about this, you know, a little bit, you know, uh, ahead of the curve, but we can tell you exactly the movement in your pelvis in relationship to your lumbar spine, in relationship to your femur, then I know canter in myself because the horses already know canter. I've seen a four-month-old horse canter in the field beautifully. So it's hard, and it goes back to a Chinese uh, uh, a saying from the Tao Te Ching, um, knowing others is wisdom, knowing yourself is enlightenment. And I, and I like to kind of, I use that for myself. I can know all the movements of the horse. I can define the cancer of the horse really well. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but can I define it in my own seat? Because I also believe, you know, that if everything I do in my body is absolutely mirrored or I believe magnified in the horse. So if I have tension in my lower lumbar, mean, meaning it holds its curve, and it kind of becomes a, a fulcrum for the lever of the spine to apply force to the back of the horses, you know, through the saddle to the horse's back. If I'm tight in my back, the horse is tight in its back. But I'm, I'm kind of, you know, the horse is kind of like uh, uh, an elf and I'm a troll. You know, they feel ounces and I barely feel pounds. So when that tension or that tightness is put into the horse's back, I, I cannot receive its force, right? It, it, it hits my back and it pushes me forward instead of up. And, and it, you know, the same thing happens in the horse's lumbar spine. When that power of the tiny foot pushing to the earth, the earth pushes back and that force travels through its, the bones of its leg into its pelvis, through its sacrum. It never gets out of the sacrum because of tension at the lower back. And then when the next pulse of force comes up, it hits that block, if you will, and it has to go somewhere, and it usually bounces back. And then you have two forces, one coming, one like a head-on collision that happened in the hawk and stifles. And I absolutely believe that it is 
It is these blocks in the rider's back that wear out hawks and stifles and why it's epidemic in the world, in the riding world, you, you know? Wow. Um, and, and, we, and we don't look at the, and not to get heavy about it, but man, can you imagine if, if, if we just for a second think about it, maybe from another perspective, not throw out the old belief, but just, you know, postpone it for a second. And, and we realize, oh, my God. I mean, most people love that my horse mirrors us. We think it's an amazing thing. And uh, I remember teaching a group of uh, uh, um, British Horse Society fellows um, uh, a couple years ago. And I was saying how, you know, they, uh, they love horses. They kind of tolerate people. And everybody smiled like, yeah, I'd much rather deal with horses than people. And, and I said, I love people. I like horses. I love people. And, uh, you know, I know that horses mirror us and they all smiled. And I said, and it should terrify you because oh. what we don't know about, because what we don't know about ourselves gets mirrored in the horse. And, and then because we don't know it's coming from us, we think it's the horse. Wow. So we spend time trying to get to know the horse. So I know that was a long story to make. Oh, sense. not a problem. Um, and hopefully it's, you know, it's, you know, um, I love the natural horsemanship movement. I love the ancient classic. I, I love riding in itself. Um, and I think with, with, you know, this, the, the genius of this ancient, you know, Chinese art, and it's not just Chinese, every old culture probably has this, you know, knowledge somewhere, but it's not. It's not common knowledge. And I hate to have to run in. We're going to, uh, we're going to have to jump in here. We are fresh out of time, but it's been a fantastic conversation. And, um, if, if people would like to start learning more about this and, uh, and find some good resources on, on some of the concepts you're talking about, where can we find you? They can, uh, find me at ridefromwithin.com. So ridefromwithin.com is my website. Um, the, the website's being kind of upgraded, so it says it's being worked on, but it's still fully functional. Um, they can email me at james at ride from within. And on the website, they can find my calendar. Uh, I teach all over the world, so we can, you know, plenty of opportunity to come meet me. And um, there's on YouTube, if you, uh, there's a lot of these concepts and techniques explain that um you can see in action yeah because i always say the horses prove my work not wonderful and we will post those links online on the website and uh, i want to thank you so much for coming on giz definitely gave me a lot to think about so i'm really excited to put some concepts into action thanks james fantastic thank you so much of course uh you can find mary's uh website at marykitzmiller.com or you can find me on Facebook at Mary Kitz Miller Horsemanship. And we'll be back tomorrow. Je- send your really bad ads into Jennifer at horseradionetwork.com and uh, she would love to get your ads so we can do them, uh, play them tomorrow on the show. Either play them or read them tomorrow on the show. You can record them yourself. You get double credits for that and we have lots of great prizes this month as well. So we'll see you tomorrow for the Friday version. Thank you, Mary. All right, thanks. And you would think I would be queued up with the closing music. Oh, there it is.